kids are this wonderful example where if it's not your kid, you see them once every six months or once every two years. What is the common vernacular? What's the thing that everyone says? Oh my God, you've grown so much. The parents don't notice that in the moment because they see them every single day. So it's a slow, gradual thing. But when you look at something and then you look it away for two years, and then you look again, what a growth spurt. That growth spurt is happening for everybody with any kind of level of sustained concentration, effort, or equity that they're putting into themselves. Welcome to Gratitude Geek. I'm Candace Ridardi. Today I'm joined by the author of the last Law of Attraction book you'll ever need to read, The Missing Key to Finally Tapping into the Universe and Manifesting Your Desires, Andrew Cap. Welcome, Andrew. Candace, thank you so much for having me. Really happy to be here and uh, excited for wherever we might take this conversation. Well, I have questions because the law of attraction is one of my favorite com my, my favorite topics of conversation, along with the law of reciprocity. So tell us your story. How did you become an authority on the law of attraction? You know, it's so like, you know, here I'm the author of this book. It's still weird to hear, like, even it phrased that way, like being the authority on it. Because um, to this day, I mean, I view myself as an authority in terms of explaining my viewpoint. But I also view like everyone's technically an authority once they've done it for a month, because everything here, it's experiential. You learn through your experiences, especially with the law of attraction. And, and that kind of like perfectly segues in, into how I got here, because I... I mean, we're close to probably 20 years now where I first learned about the law of attraction. And at that point, I was this young, struggling entrepreneur looking for the quote unquote, like secret to happiness, secret to success, secret to life, however you might phrase it. And I, law of attraction, honestly, was one of the many modalities for me. And to be really candid, it was pretty, it was hit and miss. It was inconsistent. And it took maybe four years before I realized that at least from my experience now, the law of attraction was not inconsistent. I was the inconsistent one because I, you know, I hit this really harsh wall uh, back in 2008, where I basically lost my business and my relationship of three years all in the same week, which to be melodramatic, that was like 90% of my life at the time in the span of like three or four days. And I had to take a, you know, a really hard look in the mirror and say, Andrew, you know, what are you doing here? You've wasted your 20s. You're unhappy. Nothing's going right. Like, you know, what what's going on? Like something has to give here. And I had this very strange um, simultaneous epiphany and moment of indignation where I look back on all the modalities and all the methods and all the things. And I said, you know what? I don't care what happens, when it happens, why it happens, how it happens. I don't care about any of that. I'm going to go all in on this thing once and for all, because I had this recognition that when I was doing the methods, things would start to work and then I would stop. So I'm going to go all in. In fact, not only is failure not going to deter me, but success is not going to deter me as well, because that's another trap. Sometimes things start to, you know, they're, they're working for us. We stop what we're doing because we think we're good. And then they go back down again. So I said, no matter what, um, I realize I can't do this all day, every day, human nature being what it is. But I can do five minutes of a manifesting method, a visualization, a gratitude exercise, whatever it be. I can do five minutes every single day. And Candace, it was kind of like a movie because the moment I made that decision and actually stepped into that and was not deterred by failure or success and just did it, that's where these massive shifts happened. And the way I remember the, the, the progression of events is like within two weeks, I felt way better than anyone with a broken heart had any business feeling. Within three months, I was in a brand new way, healthier relationship. Within four months, I was making more money than at any point in my life before then. And within six months, everything changed. Everything was different. I was in the best shape of my life. I was waking up happy and fulfilled. I went through a period where I lost like 25 pounds in seven weeks without technically trying. Not that I wasn't doing healthy things, but I wasn't trying to lose weight. It just came off. And I basically learned the hard way that you can call it love attraction. You call it whatever you want, whatever this thing is. It works when you work it. And I actually waited 11 years before deciding to write this book, because even though I had that epiphany then, even after that, I'd still not given myself permission to make such a bold statement, a bold promise, a bold title, like the last of attraction book you'll ever need to read. But I finally chose to step into that as well. And, you know, five years later from that, 
here we are, I'm, you know, loving my life every single day and feeling really fulfilled genuinely by the reader feedback and the direction I take with my daily practices. So I, I have three things. Hmm? One is there's so many stories of people hitting rock bottom and then bouncing back from the bottom. Uh, but you don't have to. I'm going to I'm going to make my three points and then we can touch on each of them. You don't mm -hmm. have to hit rock bottom to make your life better. <laughs> you know, I really would love to know what you did in those five minutes. That would be awesome. Mm -hmm. And then I love, love, love that you clarified that the law of attraction doesn't work unless you work. So in any order you want, touch on those three things. Well, I'll try to go in order. Um, and you could tell me I'm a bit of a rambler. So if I forget one, I'll ask you to remind me. But the first one, you, you made a very, in my opinion, very wise and insightful note there. You do not have to hit rock bottom. And I think sometimes people mistakenly and inadvertently put themselves in that position where like they tell themselves it's not going to work or nothing's going to work until they finally hit rock bottom. But you're right. You can be even on a slightly low level and just decide to make a change. So, so thank you for clarifying that because yeah, my story is memorable because of that. And a lot of people are, but yes, I couldn't agree more, more 100%. You don't have to be in a really horrible state. Although if you are, it'll work just as well. To answer your your uh, your second point, or asking like what I did before before so, we move before we move on, let's also clarify that if you have hit rock bottom, you can come back. I mean, absolutely. There, and and that's the, and that's actually the beauty of it. Any spectrum of where you are in life, from the worst of the worst to slightly worse, like if you have a, a air in your lungs and a thought in your mind, you have the agency to do this. And that actually segues me because you're curious, like, Andrew, what did you do? This sounds really, sounds amazing what happened. What did you do? The, the amazing aspect of actually, it's, it's in its simplicity. Because all I did was go back to either manifesting methods I had learned and engage in, you know, simple visualization exercises, which I can go deeper into details or, or scripting or gratitude, or knowing that this has to be a sustainable thing for me, I would actually either make up manifesting methods of my own, or I tweaked manifesting methods I was aware of in a way that would make them fun. Because the whole point of all this, in my opinion, is if you really want to be consistent with it, if you really want to guarantee it, you've got to enjoy it. You've got to be looking forward to it on to some level. Now, you can will yourself through it every single day, but one that's it's much more difficult to, to, to do. And two, if you're willing yourself through it, you are running this really high risk of actually being unhappy in a negative emotion when you're doing it, which is counterproductive. You're actually inadvertently manifesting the opposite of what you want because you're gritting your teeth through it. So for me, the really huge thing here, whether I'm visualizing on being happy with someone new or visualizing on financial abundance or whatever it might be, I made sure that the methods were easy and fun. That, And, and I, I'm also, I kept myself, I said, listen, Andrew, if you want to do an hour, that's fine. If you want to do a half hour, that's fine. But Andrew, looking at your past four years of this, I know you, you lose your patience even when you're having fun. Give yourself permission to just do five minutes a day because I'm, I'm actually working on a new project right now. It'll probably come out in a year and a half. <laughs> but I, I did the calculations where the scientists have said or researchers have said that a positive thought or emotion, they measured it with whatever whatever uh, scales they had is either hundreds or even thousands of times more powerful than the negative thought. And if you do the math of, of how many seconds or how many minutes you have in a day and you calculate those five minutes in times a thousand and you compare it to the rest of the day, literally five minutes is all you need to balance the scales or more than balance the scales of positive emotion versus negative emotion. And another reason why I can say that it works is because I did it for only five minutes and it worked. So I want to assure people, and, and by the way, it could be three minutes, it could be one minute, but for me, five minutes sound like a really good round number. It gave me time to ease into the moment, ease into the emotion. It gave me the opportunity to kind of soak it in, but it also took that pressure off of, like, I don't even have to do 10 minutes of this before going to work or going to a meeting or whatever it might be. So it was the perfect sweet spot for me. And, and again, that's what it's all about. It's all about making this convenient, accessible, easy, fun, enjoyable. Because if anything else that people were trying to do in order to improve their lives was like that, 
obviously they would have a much faster path to success. Now, there was a third thing that you had asked. I guess I'd, I'd ask you to, to remind me and clarify on, <laughs> on that one, please. The third thing was um, taking decisive action. However, before we move on to that, mm -hmm. about a year or a year and a half ago, I had Anthony Paponi. He is a happiness expert. I had him on the show. I've had him on the show a couple of times. He's a really great, engaging guest. But he taught me a gratitude practice that I have tweaked. So his mm. gratitude practice is one, two, three, four, five at 1234 state five things that you're grateful for. Well, 1235 wasn't working for me with my schedule because I always had clients at 1230. So, so I had to adjust that for my own, my own gratitude practice. So the way that I stay mindful every day that I am a grateful person is at 10 o'clock, or I'm sorry, at 1009, so 109, I do eight, eight, eight activities. One of them is I take my pills because I, I'm a cancer patient, so I have to take my pills, right? Um, and then I, I state three things that happened that day that were awesome. And I just say them out loud. I'm not a journaler, so I just say what say the groovy things out loud. And then I take four deep breaths. So that's eight activities. Pills, mm. three things I was grateful for, four deep breaths. Um, and mindful breaths, you know, breathe in, hold it, breathe out, right? That is really doing that. And there's an alarm on my phone. But that daily practice takes me a couple of minutes just like your five minute thing, but it also centers me and gets me ready for bed, right? And, and, and it really, you know, just like you, five minutes is all it takes to wake yes. up happier. And, and if I make Candace, I just wanna really highly praise you on, on what you are teaching people right now in that example, because we'll read a law of attraction book or we'll watch a law of attraction video and we'll get these instructions on doing something. Instructions, by the way, that work and that are valid. But we will often find ourselves trying to follow to the letter when it's inconsistent with our own preferences or lifestyle or or our day to day. And what you've perfectly, you know, articulated in your example here is that there's plenty of room for tweaking. There's plenty of room of making something that works for you. I get emails all the time from people after reading my book, say, Andrew, I'm on board. This works. Do I do this in the morning or do I do this in the evening? And I tell them, which is better for you? Which is the one where you're going to be more at ease, that you're not going to be rushed, that you're not going to be stressed, that you're going to enjoy it? Because let's pretend, even though it's not true necessarily, let's pretend that the morning is more valuable than the evening. If your morning is too stressed to do it, then your evening is more valuable than that. Because it's it's all about which is the one that's going to give you the best emotion that, like you just articulated in your example, is going to make it accessible. And that's the thing I, I always really implore people. So thank you for that perfect example of why it works so well when people make it work for them. Which leads into my first initial question about taking action. Yeah. So for me, I'm an intense student of the human condition and psychology and self-reflection. And again, it was through those four years of trial and error and failing a lot that I was able to recognize where I would trip myself up. So for me, the, the key to taking action is in recognizing my own faults and my own, um, I'll, I'll use a kind, you know, PG-13 word here, or PG word, my own nonsense, how I get in my own way. And what I do is I say, okay, Andrew, what are the things that you can do to clear the roadblocks for taking action? And that's where I say, I make it easy. I make it predictable. I make it fun. I, the beauty of the law of attraction in particular and these manifesting methods is it's not like lifting weights. Lifting weights, even when you enjoy it, it's hard work. You have to really exert effort for this. But when you're talking about these visualization exercises or, or scripting, which I can go into, or just gratitude methods, you don't even have to intensely feel the emotion. You don't even have to put yourself under that pressure. All you have to do is feel just okay. Because when you're not feeling negative and you're feeling even in a slight direction of positive, you are already on the right path, which leaves plenty of room. So the way I took my decisive action of doing these methods is just giving myself permission and making them fun and easily accessible. And then the way I took action on top of that, here's the really cool part. Once I gave myself this opportunity to explore the methods and dive in with just five minutes a day, it changed me. It rewired my brain for me so that, you know, filling out a dating profile or going after a job opportunity and, and taking that physical action, it became a natural, easy result. 
it's what Abraham Hicks calls inspired action. I was inspired to take that action. It was not like something that I had to grit my teeth to make it happen. I was excited to do it. I was happy to do it. So by clearing the pathway to doing the methods, that cleared the pathway for me to actually step into actually doing things about it on top of it. I want to go back to the scripting, but before you mm -hmm. move on to scripting, touch a little bit deeper on inspired action. That's one of my favorite phrases, and I use it a lot, but mm -hmm. a lot of people don't understand what it means. Yeah, so I'll I'll use love as an example just because there's so many possibilities and so many ways of putting that, and it's, it's less cliche than money, although well, I could talk about money. So let's say like you're looking for love, and you feel like you can't find the perfect, you know, the person of your dreams, the perfect person you're meant to be with. Okay, so you're going to figure out manifesting methods that are just easy for you to visualize what that person might be like. And an easy method right now, I mean, I have a I think called a gratitude blitz, where you set a timer for a certain amount of time, you just come up with things you're grateful for. In the context of, of you know, finding that person, set a timer for five minutes and think I, of all I, the qualities I that just, you're grateful for. I just for. love that idea of a gratitude blitz. Yeah, I love that idea. On and on and on and on and on. It's funny, my, I, I'm, I'm so intentional about my book to be spaced out so that the reader's eye just like glides through the whole thing. And there's one page in a book where there's no space. It's just like one block of text of all the things like I'm grateful for that I thought of off the, on the fly. But yeah, you get this blitz and you think of all these qualities of, of that you're grateful to be for. And you do that enough and you enjoy it enough where one day you're going to wake up and you're like, you know what? I think today's the day that I'm going to join Hinge. Or you know what? Today's the day I'm going to I'm going to hire a photographer to follow me around and take really good photos of me for my profile. You know what? Today's the day I'm inspired to tweak my profile to say something that I didn't have the courage to say yesterday that ends up attracting that person. Maybe you say something bold. Maybe, I mean, obviously everyone thinks Star Wars is cool these days, but there was a time where people thought it wasn't cool. Maybe the person finds like, I'm going to be brave enough on my dating profile to say I love Star Wars. And then the love of their life who also loves Star Wars notices that on the profile and is now brave enough to reach out to them. So inspired action is about doing something, whether it's physical or it's just a choice, it's a decision, it's something that you write, it's something you you intend or you say, and all of a sudden you are acting, um, really fulfilling your desires and taking these actions that are you kind of like in the deep subsets of your mind, you kind of know what you're supposed to do. You just don't have immediate access to it. You find yourself automatically. Uh, it's almost as if your subconscious mind is now steering the wheel because it knows exactly where to take you. That is is my best off the cuff, yet rambly uh, explanation <laughs> of, of what it really means to take inspired action. I want to add to the whole uh, dating profile thing. So I've been married for... Uh, more than 25 years, but I'm not sure how many more. <laughs> <laughs> um, be, but before I met my husband, I was on one of those dating profile apps that they it, that existed before we had phone apps. So, you know, dating website. And I met a man and on our first date, he that, you know, our profiles matched and we had a conversation and it seemed like, OK, I'll go on a date with this guy. So on our first date, he was wearing a Star Trek communicator badge that you could actually push and it would beep. Mm. And we dated until he moved. <laughs> 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 because he showed up as his authentic self. And I yes. just happened to have been attracted to that authentic self that he came that he showed up as, you know, and that was in the early 90s, right? So that was before it was cool to like Star Trek, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Although I'm not sure that's true. I think it's always been cool to like Star Trek, but <laughs> yeah, for the right people, right? Especially yeah. your right person. Yeah, for for my right person. But I ended up marrying a man, and when uh, we got married, the uh, Star Trek Voyager series and Star Trek Deep Space Nine were on, and that was what we would do, do together. They were on the same night, and we would. That was our night that we looked forward to watching TV together when we first, first started dating and into our marriage. You know, I have Star Wars art on my wall, but really, I'm a Star Trek fan. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, but hey, listen, um, if, if it's in the stars, it's all good, right? <laughs> it's, right exactly. But um, yeah, I mean, that that is what uh, there are a lot of other things that my husband have in, have, have in common. There's more things that we don't have in common than we do, but we had that one, you know, grounded, authentic, this is what we really love. And we love it about each other thing, yeah. right? And so that that's why it's really important to be authentic in your dating profiles. Yes. You know? and, and I've noticed people like, 
whenever I've really had strong feelings for people and I could look, I try to look back, it's, it's a hard thing to dissect. You almost don't want to, but, but I've had this recognition that it's those people that are unapologetic in their passions. Like, I don't know if you think this is stupid, but I don't care. And this is just me, you know, that's, that's kind of like the attitude that I love, whether or not I'm into that thing. And, and there's, there's a power and a magic to it. And again, quickly, like going back into inspired action, we will often filter and censor ourselves because they're thinking, oh, if I put down this Star Trek or Star Wars thing, all these people that might work for me are going to pass on me because they're going to think I'm, I'm silly or whatever. And not ironically not realizing that they want that filter they want to get rid of the wrong people for them and this blaring green flag for the right people oh, and yeah. then when you do these methods and you're thinking about it, you're like okay today's the day i'm going to put this down well part of the law of attraction is also learning how to repel you know a magnet has two sides one attracts one repels mm -hmm. you need to have a balance you can't just keep attracting all the wrong things when you you want to attract the right things and repel the wrong things you know that's i've never heard it put that way so brilliantly before and thank you and i i steal all my ideas attracting... from other people <laughs> yeah it's like cool because think about it um i i have a bottle on my on my desk right now the only reason that i can put the bottle down is because there isn't a jug of something else already there you have to the the beauty of that's really cool i never thought of it now i have this visualization of like not only attracting what i want but automatically the things that i don't want being repelled and me being safe and protected from that and me being insulated from that because it is a one and it's an automatic thing that's the beauty of it when you're it's it's like a seesaw when one side goes up the other side goes down and you can't make them both go up at the same time and that's the beauty of this you know law of attraction getting what you want and not getting what you don't want but you can also balance a seesaw True, but um, yes, probably I guess it's a, bit, it's a bad explanation, but I'll say this. No, but 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 it, it's an addition to your explanation because sometimes mm -hmm. that you do need the balance. Yes. Some things, well, I mean, if you don't want, I'm trying to think of something bad, but it, let's say that you want to lose weight, uh, but you hate exercise. Well, mm -hmm. If you want to lose weight, you have to do some sort of movement and exercise. So you need to balance your seesaw. Right. Right. And and we often think of things in extremes. So like before even thinking about well, like, oh, I have to do the exercise, right? To do the nutrition, our brains are like, well, I have to be in shape. Like there's we're so hyper focused on that. And I mean, you make a really good point. Like, and I believe though, like hearing you kind of say it that way and putting in the balance, the balance to me, it comes from the insight and wisdom you gain from allowing yourself to engage in the process. Meaning it's, in my opinion, a lot harder to strike that balance and recognize that balance when you're not first engaging in methods and getting yourself in a vibrational and psychological state where you can invite the result that you actually think you're wishing for. I'm going to pivot just a little bit. This morning, I was listening to a, a conversation between Simon Sinek and Trevor Noah. Trevor Noah is a comedian. Simon Sinek is one of the greatest minds of our generation. Uh, and they were talking about friendship. It was a very interesting, I only got about 15 minutes in the conversation, so I haven't heard the whole thing, but it was a very interesting uh, treatise on how social media has made us lonelier. Mm. And Simon Sinek was talking about this experiment where one mouse was put in a enclosure and he had two bowls of water. One bowl of water was fresh water and the other bowl was like, was spiked with drugs. And eventually the mouse stopped drinking the fresh water and only drank the drug laced water until he killed himself. Hmm. And so another, and I will put the show, this, I will put the link to this interview in the show notes because it's very fascinating. And I only listened to it once, so I'm probably gonna get some of it wrong. So then another researcher came along and said, I think that, that, that this research is flawed. I'm gonna try another experiment. So he put a whole bunch of mice in an enclosure and gave them things to do the mice started breeding and having families but he can but but back to the same one bowl of fresh water one bowl of water that was spiked with drugs and every mouse drank some of the drunk some of the drugged water but none of the mice became addicted and died because they had community and friendship and i i to me, the law of attraction, this, this wraps into the law of attraction because I have been, uh, and I hate to admit this, but I've been a little, I don't want to say scared, but apprehensive 
because of what I see going on in the world right now, where there, there's just so much hatred, and the the hatred is attracting more hatred. It was is attracting more hatred. I'm saying it out loud because I I don't I and I wish I wasn't because I don't want to make it true, um, but I think that we could start some sort of global movement where instead of spreading that hatred, we could spread love, which again, I've only listened to 15 minutes of the, of the conversation between the two of them, but it just, it's on my heart right now. So you get to talk to me about it. Do you want to add some insight about, about global attraction? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll compare it this way. Remember, like I just gave that example of, you know, one thought is again, I'm not the one that did the measurements. Um, and there's different varying opinions, which is why I say anywhere from hundreds to thousands of times more powerful than negative thought. By that rationale, we've got, what, 8 billion people on the planet right now? Doing quick math on my head, just 100,000 people, which is not that hard. I mean, you go on YouTube channels and how many channels have 100,000 100, subscribers? A lot more than you might imagine, you know? If 100,000 people in a community meditated every day on positivity for the world, it's like the extra mice in the cage where it's making an impact because that is way, the, the negativity seems more potent because it's right in front of our face and because we're seeing it every day. It's more potent in the sense that we're getting more experiences of it. But, you know, there is, in my view, in my belief, there is plenty of room for a shift to occur that takes a lot less of a starter fire than we might believe. Because I think part of the problem that we have where it's like, oh, we can never fix this is the faulty belief, the illusion that we can't. If we actually thought we could, we actually realized we could, we would take much stronger, more decisive, faster, more efficient action right now. Yeah. And that's the thing. We have to believe that we can be better. That we can yes. that, that we can make a better world. I'm not bringing it up in my card catalog in my brain right now, so perhaps you know. Wasn't there, and I may be remem misremembering, so, well, again, if it's true, it will be in the show notes. Wasn't there a town or a community that did that, that they they took a mind, was it in India? Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, well, I've heard a lot of different stories. I, I do remember vaguely it's a story about a town doing it. I, I've heard stories about um, monks doing it and, and impacting, like, I think maybe like a, was it like a three? There was a, it was a very wide radius where they, they people's health and moods and, and crime weights went, went down. There's um, a story about um, in Hawaii, though, I think it was in Hawaii where a prison where a doctor did that, and I'm going to mispronounce it in butcher, so I apologize, the, the Hopanopo or something like that, where it was basically he kept, he sat in his office. He was a psychologist that was supposed to, like, you know, help the prisoners reform. He didn't have one conversation with them because everyone else thought they were impossible. He sat in his office all day and he meditated on the idea of, like, I'm sorry, I love you, please forgive me, thank you. Maybe in a different order, but... I'm sorry. I love you. Please forgive me. Thank you. That's all he did. And all of a sudden, these these mentally insane patients that were hopeless cases, changes occurred and, and there was there was progress with them. So there were all these different examples that I've I've peripherally heard of. And I'm one of those people where I, I kind of almost feel like I'm I'm cheating people by by not doing it. I don't memorize exact details i just hear the stories i take it in i have gratitude for it i move on and then i end up being on a podcast where i only give like loose details but but i can definitely validate remembering about the town as well i don't think that this is i mean it, i i googled it because i wanted to clarify or verify um there are two different ways that i fi i'm finding it and one of them is i love you i'm sorry please forgive me thank you and the other one is i'm sorry please forgive me thank you i love you and mm -hmm. it, that i love you again going back to that simon sinek and trevor noah conversation the i love you is so important simon sinek also shared a story about a um a soldier that he is friends with um, a military per person that he's friends with and simon started telling him i love you and eventually the soldiers started saying it back and now their friendship is even deeper and not in a sexual way. Don't take it in a sexual way in a, in a, in a male to male friendship way. Right. But mm -hmm. just, just the words of, I love you just saying, I love you. It's huge. I, I had a guest on the show years ago who hold help. She would hold up signs on the side of the road that said, I love you just because she wanted to spread more of that in the world. And I think that's what, I mean, I'm again, 
you get to be the person that I talk to when I, at the time that this is most on my heart. But that's what we need in the world right now. We need more love. There's mm -hmm. a lot of hate out there and we just need some more love. So yes. um, let's, let's pivot again to gratitude. So you have called it an anchor that you can use gratitude to anchor your, your mindset. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, well, there, there's many examples I give, um, but whenever I get going down that conversation, it's all about finding a really good method that, that really, I'm all about dynamically like sinking your teeth in into this in a way that it just, it leaves an impression. It's like one of my favorite methods for my book I like to teach, I call it the time-lapse method. And the reason I love it is because it simultaneously really instills gratitude on a dynamic level from your past, present, and future. And, and the way the method works is, um, and you can use any number, but I say 15. I, I write 15 things down that I'm grateful for. Five are from my past, five are from my present, and five are from my future. And what I do is I then jumble up the list so that maybe the first list is a present thing, and then there's a past thing, and then a present, and then the present, and another future. And then one statement at a time, I read through it out loud or in my mind, it doesn't matter, whichever one I want to do. And I just take a, maybe 20 seconds just to really feel gratitude for that statement. And then I move on to the next one. And the reason I strategically do this, and this is a tweak on an old method that didn't go even near this, this level of dyna dynamicism, that's a word. Um, the reason I do it this way is because my study and, and research on the human mind is we don't downshift very easily. But the gratitude that you can feel for past and present things has a certain level of potency and certainty because it exists or existed. You actually experienced it. Therefore, when you read the future things, the same certainty that otherwise would not have ex existed there, the same level of gratitude and positive emotion is there for the future things as well. So it's like you want the love of your life and you have a statement, I'm so grateful for meeting the love of my life. And you're reading that in a sandwich between the apartment that you currently have that you love and the cat that you currently have that you love or the pet or whatever it might be, there's just more power to it. So you're being strategic at the same time. You're just enjoying the moment. And, and that's me that, that it's about anchoring it really deeply, your emotions and your positive emotions by leveraging stuff that you've already enjoyed or are enjoying and have manifested. Mm, I love that because, you know, everybody has had these super groovy things happen to them in their lives. And if we forget about them, we, we don't have anything. I, I love that these these moments that you can anchor to. I have the feeling of the first time your baby is put on your chest after you give birth. I mean, that feeling is enormous because you go from being in pain to to feeling this love that you didn't even know you were capable of feeling. Yes. You have no idea what love feels like until a baby is put on your chest. You yeah. don't even. And I literally it. have no idea that because it's never happened to me. I can't, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I but recognize but, though that I don't know. But it, but it's never happened to most men. Yes. Right. It's it's mm -hmm. a it's a distinct feeling between a mother who has given birth and a and a newborn baby. It's a distinct it's a, feeling. It's a true level of potency that can't be manufactured. It exactly. Be exactly. Um, I want to talk about downshifting. Mm -hmm. Because the first thing that I thought of when you said that was if you need to get up a really steep hill, you have to downshift. Um, so sometimes downshifting is really important to get where you need to go. In what, I guess, in other words, to to better comment on that, what, what would be an example of you downshifting? We don't drive stick shifts anymore, but mm -hmm. I learned how to drive with a stick shift. So, you know, if you wanted to get up a steep hill, six, six degree incline, it's hard. Your car, car starts to go, go, go really slow and most automatics have trouble doing it. But if you were driving a stick shift and you downshifted, you could get up that hill faster than any of the automatics next to you because you, you, were, you were telling the car what to do. Um, so downshifting is, it can be thought of as steering not steering is the wrong word, but manipulating the route, I guess, manipulating right. how fast you can go. Let me think. Um, and just to clarify, if this helps, when I hear downshifting, because sometimes we hear things in, in loaded words, in, in different words, um, I hear like a state change. Yeah. Is that it a is fair a way of putting change. it? That is, it is a state change. Okay. So for me, you know, because you're right, sometimes it requires effort or energy to exert your focus. Um, for me, the way... I achieve a state change when I need to is to stop and breathe and focus and give myself permission to let it happen without trying to rush it. And sometimes it's the hardest thing to not rush it. It's we, we, we were so impatient. We're 
we are in such an instant gratification world right now. You know, I was watching um, a video of, uh, you know, Linkin Park. They have a new singer and they're on tour. And, you know, I'm, I'm watching videos of their performances. Isn't their new and, singer a woman? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think her name's Emily Armstrong. Um, so I'm sure that they're, I'm not a fan. Of, I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm not engaged in Linkin Park. I might know their music, but I don't know that they are the musician that goes with that song. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm I'm imagining that there might be some fans right now that are mad because they replaced oh, yeah. the woman. Absolutely. I mean, j just, you know, woman or man, there's a different person in there than than their former lead singer yeah. who, who'd passed. Um, and the reason I, I brought it up for my, this example is because watching these performances, obviously they want to excite their fans and they want to get these really powerful um, concerts. But there was like flashing lights and it just it felt like so much. And that's kind of like a visualization where sometimes people are just trying to like force something. It's so loud where if you have to downshift, it takes more of a, of a sense of ease and calm. And, you know, we were again, we're Con in this control of, to me, yes. it's control. Mm -hmm. If you're downshifting, you're controlling the outcome. Yeah. Well, and it requires agency over yourself and, yeah. and oftentimes we are practiced to not have agency over ourselves we are practiced to looking at the flashing lights so it basically to me downshifting it requires a level of patience and it's something that you build equity in that there, it, there's compound interest meaning if you're having trouble today you start working on today you don't just do it for today you do it for the fact that when you keep doing it in a sustained way a year from now you're going to wake up and you'll be like oh my god look at the progress i've made and, you know, you brought up the example of, you know, a baby putting, put, being put on, on, your, on your chest for the first time. Kids are this wonderful example where if it's not your kid, you see them once every six months or once every two years. What is the common vernacular? What's the thing that everyone says? Oh, my God, how you've grown so much. The parents don't notice that in the moment because they see them every single day. So it's a slow, gradual thing. But when you look at something and then you look it away for two years, and then you look again. What a growth spurt. That growth spurt is happening for everybody with any kind of level of sustained concentration, effort, or equity that they're putting into themselves. So it might feel like a very incremental thing of like a little bit of agency of yourself, a little bit of control, a little bit of downshifting. But if you really were to jump into the future of a year from now of doing that for every day, you would be astounded by the level of success and progress that you've got. Yeah. So do you want to talk about ego? Mm. So before you, you use the term, I love you. And then you said, not in a sexual way. And it's very, it's very interesting you said that because the reason you clarified that is because the word love is such a loaded word that we're all bringing meaning to. Same with sex, same with God, same with all these different things, right? Yeah. And in English, you know, and in English we only mm -hmm. have that word love. In yes. a lot of other languages, there are multiple words for this for for the different feelings that in English love means. Yes, yes, of course. And and the reason I bring that up is ego, technically, on a lesser level, is also a loaded word because I want to clarify that my definition of ego is not necessarily what you know a clinically trained psychologist, because I'm not one, would would say. So so just for I want to give that clarity to people because my version of ego can be different, but. But the way I view ego is I actually, I view, I view it as having three minds. We've got the conscious mind, we've got our subconscious mind, and right in the middle, we have the ego. And I say the middle in terms of power and potency, because the ego is way stronger than the conscious mind, but fortunately for us, nothing compared to the subconscious. And the reason I say fortunately is because my definition of the ego is it's that part of your mind that has only one interest and one interest only, and that's your survival. And I bring that up because a lot of people, they'll start using law of attraction manifesting methods and things won't go right for them or they'll find, they'll find themselves quit. Like they'll, they'll find a way to stop from doing what's working for them. And they're like, well, what's going on here? All I want to do is be rich and famous. What's so wrong about that? What they don't realize is their ego, when, they, when you say you want to be rich and famous, your ego's like, okay, that's nice and everything, but me being the ego and caring about your survival, I'm worried that if you become rich, all these people are going to come out of the woodwork and try to sue you and, and just ruin your life. If you become famous, 
I'm your me being your ego and worried about your survival. I'm worried about you getting stalkers. So I'm going to be a good little ego and be very responsible. And I'm going to short circuit your success before you screw us both. And it's very important to have that recognition because if you understand your ego in a misguided way, it's just trying to look out for you. Well, then when you find yourself deviating off course, even when things are working, you can say, oh, all right, I, I see what's happening here. I have an awareness. Now I can do something about it. And that's why making manifesting methods so fun and so enjoyable and so convenient, only five minutes, that you then access the subconscious mind, which it's like e the ego against a subconscious mind is like a person versus a grizzly bear. They are just not going to win. The subconscious mind is going to power through. And that's where no matter what the ego is scared of, you are going to start taking the actions that you need to be rich or famous or whatever it is that you need in your life or think that you want in your life that's going to be successful and make you more happy and fulfilled. Yeah, and I love that you you make it fun because you, you don't – going back to the inspired action, if that action that you have to take isn't fun, you're not going to want to do it. It's a know? much steeper hill to climb. No matter how desirable the thing on the other side of that action is. Mm -hmm. Because what's more desirable to the ego that's more powerful than your conscious mind? Survival. And all it knows right now in this moment, regardless of how miserable you might be, regardless about how bad your money situation or your love situation or even your health situation, regardless of where you are in your life right now that you might not like, all your ego knows right now is you are alive. It does not want to risk the status quo. You know, maybe working out is is in the best interest but since your ego doesn't have, it has a certain level of calculating ability but it can't calculate if lifting weights is actually going to help you therefore it fears any change that might happen because it can't predict what it's going to be yeah yeah so over your shoulder are mm -hmm. both of your books over your shoulders are both of your books one of them is the law of attraction book and the other one is just feel good so i'm going to tell you a story um i have never been a mary Kay consultant mary Kay just celebrated their 61st anniversary, the company Mary Kay, 64. On the 13th of uh, September, they turned 61. That's a long time for a company to be in business. And mm. a lot of it has to do with the tenacity of Mary Kay Ash. So in the 90s, I watched a PBS documentary. This is back in the day when we didn't have streaming YouTube. It was a documentary on PBS about Mary Kay. It must have been a birthday or so, you know, an anniversary of the company or something, one of those big things back, you know. And um, Again, I've never been a Mary Kay consultant. The, 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 the idea of selling makeup is not appealing to me. But I thought Mary Kay was a very interesting person, so I wanted to watch this documentary on her. During the, and this is the only part of this documentary, which was probably an hour long. This is the only part that I know, I remember. She walked up to a woman who worked at the corporate office and said, how are you doing? And the woman said, I'm just fine, ma'am. And Mary Kay walked, got closer to her and said, when somebody asks you, how you were feeling, you always say fantastic. Because even if you're not feeling fantastic, saying you are fantastic makes it so. That goes back to feel good. So talk about feeling good. It really, so you'll notice on, you know, I, I'm sure people hear, some people will see this on video, some people hear audio, it's just to articulate the, the cover of Just Feel Good. It kind of looks like this um, jumbled up uh, parchment with just the words, just feel good with the sky and nature in the background. And the the vision of the cover was like, it's almost like a treasure map where like X marks the spot, but ironically, the treasure is the map or the message of the map, which is my long-winded way of saying, if you could just feel good, you are so, you're, you're, you're on your way to solving everything you need to. Because every manifesting method that I teach and I advise people, whenever th they'll, they'll send me emails and they always try to overcomplicate it, I say, okay, here's the point of the manifesting method. Its intention is to make you feel good while thinking about what you have or thinking about what you want or both. If that's all you have to, that's all you do, if you just do that, you are set. And again, we were talking a few minutes ago about like the, the state of the world and the level of negativity, the level of hate and fear and uncertainty and doubt. The fear is is your elixir, your antidote, your your relief from uh, feeling good. It's it's your it's your relief from that. Just feeling good. If you could just do that, find a way for yourself, then you've got the keys to the castle. It really is. I I'm sure it's frustrating for some people that are in a bad state to hear right now. It's frustrating for to hear me say this. It really is that simple. And if they only did it, they would get that level of awareness. Like oh. 
Andrew wasn't, you know, lying to me. It's actually that simple. I love that phrase. When you appreciate what you have, what you have appreciates. Mm, yes. Yeah. And the, the word appreciate has two meanings. It's a feeling that you have of gratitude. And it's also, a gr gr it also means growth, right? How cool is that? It, I think it, gr gratitude and growth in one word. Yeah. You know, I it's, mean, it's like, what, what, a, what a perfect word. It, it's, it's amazing. And again, I would, I would implore people. And by the way, it's, it's easy, you know, law of attraction author, his life must be perfect or he's pretending it's perfect. No, it's not. Um, I've not. And law I've of attraction isn't pretending. Right. It's not. If you're, if you're pretending, you're doing it wrong. Exactly. If you're gritting your teeth, you're keeping things away. And you know what? I have not been upset today, but I was upset yesterday and that's fine. I got over it. I moved on. I made sure the majority of my energy was towards positivity. And um, for me, it's working. And for anyone that's ever written me and reported back, it's working for them. So again, it's kind of like a science experiment. If you're looking at results, test the hypothesis yourself and see how it goes. That's what I would implore to people. Oh, I love that. Uh, so we, we, um, we've we already talked about it, but I, I want to I want to um, I want to dig into this concept that the law of attraction is not a step by step process. Mm -hmm. So you can think of it, it. It's funny because you can successfully think of it as a step by step process if that allows you to engage in it. But it's more dynamic than that. So it, it's kind of like, OK, the, I don't know if this is a perfect example, but if you look at your hand under the right microscope, it's not going to appear solid under the microscope. It's just vibrating energy. So what look might look like linear steps to you in a certain way, it's actually just a flow of energy. It's, you know, the, the instant you kind of put out to the universe, it was already on its way back to you. And it's only a question of, are you putting out conflicting intentions to keep it from completing that process or are you not? But it really is a, a smooth dynamic progression because we, again, as human beings, we look at things from a linear level and again, if that helps us engage in the process, awesome. But when you're, when I'm thinking about something that I want, the, the web of, you know, it's not a straight line of what I want. It's a web reaching out to so many different things. If, if I want to sell a million copies of my book and I'm focusing on that, there's a, there's a, there's a thread of a web that's reaching out to some person in, in a different country that they, they have their own worldwide podcast and they're going to read the book and they're going to want to have me on and expose me to, you know, 20,000 more people than I had to have. Another person is just going to read it and recommend it to one friend, which is the more valuable thing. I actually don't worry about that. I don't care. It's like, it's just, it's a web extending out. And it, if, if people, once people allow themselves to see it in that, that dynamic way, it adds a fuel to the power of the emotion that they feel, and it makes it more sustainable for, and easy for them to be consistent, which is where the momentum really comes from anyway. So there are a lot of people listening to this show right now who are micropreneurs who have a book inside of them that they want to write. What's your mm. advice to them as an author? Well, is it a nonfiction or fiction? Because that that brings up in different things. But I would I would say this. When you're writing a book, it's a really personal thing, and you really get glued to it in a certain level. It, like, you know, what's this doing for me? I would implore you to, every step of the way, also ask, like, what are you doing for your reader? If it's a fiction book, what are you doing to enrich their moment and help them escape from whatever is bothering them in the day? And if it's a nonfiction book, if it's teaching them something, are, are you explaining something in the most useful, potent, simplified, easy to implement, user-friendly way? Like to, to me, it's about like, how is this book going to serve your reader? How is it going to deliver for them? Because when you do that, that's where you write a powerful book that sells a lot of copies, gets five-star reviews on Amazon, gets positive word of mouth, gets passed around, gets recommendations, gets you on podcasts, and hopefully makes you fulfilled also. The Richest Man in Babylon was written a hundred years ago, possibly. Mm. My, I might be wrong there, but I'm sure that it made more money 20 years ago than it did when it was first released mm -hmm. because the audience caught up to the book, right? Yes. You know, I'm, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, it may have been a bestseller when it was first released, but it became a bestseller in the early 2000s when the law of attraction, when people started to understand the law of attraction again, because the law of attraction is, is ancient. I mean, it's, it's a concept that's been around for 
millennia, right? Maybe in different names, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they used the law of attraction 150 years ago to create some of the biggest wealth in the United, you know, in, in the history of the world in the United States. These barons of the late 1800s, they understood the law of attraction and they used it for their benefit. Um, I don't know if it was good or evil. I mean, you can, you can use your own, um, what's what I'm looking for, your own you can decide for yourself whether or not you thought they were good or evil, but um, they they knew, they harnessed it, they understood the law of attraction 150 years ago, and then we it's like we discovered it again in the early 2000s, right? But it never went away. It never went away. Right. Well, you know, it's the power of the internet, right? Now, it's because the richest man actually just brings me to one more point I'm going to make about you know people that are writing their book. I highly recommend a cover that can be you, where you can easily read the title in small print on Amazon because people be looking at it on an Amazon screen. And also, if you're nonfiction, have a title. Don't worry about a cool sounding title. Worry about a useful sounding title. If it's nonfiction. Make sure it sounds useful to the reader. And the reason I bring that up is my belief about The Richest Man in Babylon, why it did so well, is because when the law of attraction kind of took off again in the 2000s and you had the internet, Richest Man in Babylon doesn't really tell you necessarily like what you're getting out of that book. That's true. It's a bad title. <laughs> but but it was mentioned in forums with the law of attraction. Like, hey, if you guys are into law of attraction, well, you should read The Richest Man in, in Babylon. Then all of a sudden it gets. So there's other ways by which things get around. And, you know, the world may be ready for a book. It may not be ready for it. But when you're writing a message that's true to you, it's good, it's it's going to happen and, you know, true to the reader. But but again, Things take off for a variety of different reasons. Um, all I would implore people is like for yourself, for a book, whatever you can do to add positive ingredients for yourself, do whatever you can do and then let the universe do the rest for you. But you're only doing letting it do the rest because you've already done your part. Yeah. And, but the, the thing with the font on the front of the book, and the size mm -hmm. of the font, that is true for web graphics and everything. The less you write on the on the graphic, and the bigger the font, the more likely it is to be read. Yes. And it's so like, true. For, go ahead. And even like for, for me, people watching this in video, I mean, the conversation that we've had right now has shaped and sculpted the opinions that people have of me just based on what I've said. But their first instance, of, their first view of me, if they've never heard of me before, why does this dude have these huge posters of books behind him? It's like, well, if there's going to be a sound bite and hopefully I say something that sounds good, if I just have the book itself out here, can't even read it. Like I am thinking of like, okay, can I like legitimately stand behind my message? Am I proud enough of my books? And can I represent them well that I don't feel silly or ostentatious by having such a big title? And it's like, even that, that decision-making process, I realize it's a lot for people until they hear what I say. And they're like, oh, Andrew's a lot for people. So it makes perfect sense. But, <laughs> you know, it's it's all about, making an impression in a way that hopefully has some integrity behind it. And again, it's not just an impression on people. It's an impression on the universe. You know, again, five minutes a day, focusing on what makes you feel good while thinking about what you have or what you want or both. You are, that's basically giving the universe your huge two poster sized book covers on screen so that it can see very clearly what it is that you want. In uh, online presentation, that's screen presence, right? So you have your stage presence when you're on a stage. And when you're on a Zoom meeting, you have to have your Zoom presence, right? Your screen presence. And mm -hmm. there is a there is a, a plugin for Zoom called Prezi. And it's Prezi Video for Zoom is what it's called. Um, and it is a fantastic tool for putting something next to your face on the screen next to you, just like you have put your books. But the books there behind you, I mean, I wouldn't have talked about Just Feel Good if I hadn't seen it behind you because I was focused on the Law of Attraction book, mm. right? So you have reminded the people looking at you who you are and what you do. You yes. wrote two books, and there they are. And, and by the way, and I'm gonna, I mean this, um, Candice, you're an absolute pro. Um, I've been on shows, though, where people will, will misphrase my book because it's a long title. It's kind of my fault, you know? So I just have it there also. It's like a cheat sheet even for a podcast host to read the title and be like, okay, I'm like, you were one of the first in, in a long time to, to include the subtitle in the introduction. I'm like, oh, Candace is on it. Um, but yeah, like it's such a, it's a dynamic thing. Like every decision that we make, you know, and because this is for micropreneurs who, who are thinking about like the details, I think it's, it's a perfect, you know, 
don't know if metaphor or analogy is the right thing. I've always swapped those two, but it's like how you're presenting yourself to prospective clients. Okay, how are you presenting yourself to the universe? How are you presenting yourself to yourself? What is your vision of who you are and your identity? And are you, are you keeping your promise? You know, I was, I was thinking the other day about self-confidence and self-confidence comes from self-trust and self-trust comes from keeping promises to yourself. You're going to be way more confident if you say, okay, I promise to like eat this healthy food and then eat the healthy food. Or I promise to make this, you know, prospecting call and then make the prospecting call. I promise to write one chapter and then at least put a first draft of one chapter or one paragraph or one page. Make promises to yourself that you know you can keep and then keep them. And that also adds to the magnification and the power and the potency of your desires and your confidence and willing willfulness to achieve them. I, I think trust is an important part of the law of attraction as well. Absolutely. So important. You have to trust yourself and you have to trust others. Yeah, because if you don't, then if there is doubt there, and I, I'm always hesitant to say this because then people are worried about doubt and then worry is a negative emotion. But if you're allowing worry, doubt, uncertainty, fear to seep into the process, even when you're thinking about the thing that you want, you're kind of like diluting it at best and repelling it at worst. It's, it's So for me, it's like for five minutes, I'm going to give myself permission to not worry about it and just think about it. For five minutes, I'm not going to look, I'm not going to keep score and be like, oh, it's been 22 days and something has to happen in 30 days. I'm not going to do that nonsense. For five minutes, I'm going to be like, okay, does this genuinely feel good thinking about this thing? Because you know what? If it doesn't feel good, then why do I even want it? Mm -hmm. Okay, I want it. It must feel good. It must feel good to have clients pouring in. It must be feel good to have five-star reviews pouring in for the book. It must feel good to have everyone talking about me. It must be feel good to get that that award. It must feel good to have that big publisher take me on. It must feel good to meet the love of my life and have a great first date and a great first kiss with them and hold their hand for the first time and talk about Star Trek for the first time. I must feel good. Okay, I'm going to think about that and not worry about how or when it's going to happen because I've noticed that when I don't worry about the timing or the speed with which it happens, I often get something better and faster than I even was expecting. And turn that must into a just. Yes. You can use that if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> Careful, I just, my, well, I, I refuse, I, I'm always gonna have to credit where it gets in. So every time I say like, I heard this from Candace, it's an awesome <laughs> podcast host, but. I, I take I, I take ideas from other people all the time, and I try to give credit where credit is due. It's not always possible because sometimes you forget where you learn things. Everything that we know today, somebody else taught us, mm. right? We None of us have... are standing on the shoulders of giants. Exactly, it's, it's wonderful. Exactly, I am looking at this clock, going, "Darn it, I have more questions to ask." Will you please <laughs> come back on the show next year? I would love. Thank you for the invite. I would love to have. Whenever you want me back, I'm on board. I want to sneak one thing in just because you mentioned you. You, uh, you dropped into the, in case the audience is wondering, scripting is simply journaling about your life as if it's the perfect life that you're leading already in the present tense. Scripting the details, whatever feels good. I just want to get that definition out there because you mentioned it. So if people are wondering, now they know. Thank you for coming back to that because we did skip over it. I appreciate it. All right. Unfortunately, we have reached the end of the conversation. This is your moment of gratitude. Andrew Cap. for whom or what are you most grateful? Health, wealth, and happiness. It sounds so easy to say, and it's not one, I'm cheating because I'm doing more than one thing, but I found that they really, they blend together. When you're healthy, you're happy. When you're happy, it creates room for health. That creates room for wealth. So I'm grateful for the health, wealth, and happiness I've enjoyed, the health, wealth, and happiness I will continue to enjoy, and hopefully the health, wealth, and happiness that everyone listening can continue to facilitate in their lives. Thanks for tuning in to Gratitude Geek, the podcast for grateful micropreneurs building genuine, lasting relationships with clients, colleagues, and community. Our theme music is Track 14 by Rev Brock and Soul Lily. To connect with Andrew Cap, head over to the show notes at gratitudegeek.com. This is episode 246. I've been your host, Candice Rodarty. Stay groovy, my friends. Stay groovy, my friends. I know we can make it easier than they can. Make it better than before